In this video, we're going to take a look at the pagan conversion to Christianity. That's coming up. Righto guys, I know this is going to be a bit of a sensitive topic for some people. So there's a whole bunch of things I want to say before we get into the video itself. Number one, uh, spelling and the actual definition of words really only became standardised in the Victorian era. And so it's difficult sometimes to really get a good grasp of history. For this particular period of time, there is a real lack of written evidence, uh, especially when we think about a, a variety of written evidence. So we're relying on just a few sources, which we'll get into in a few minutes, uh, and that creates the problem of perceived bias, uh, especially when you consider that a lot of the written sources at the time were from Christian monks. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on a little bit here. Uh, myself, in terms of a disclaimer, uh, I was born and raised a Christian. Uh, that said, I don't believe that I am prejudiced in any way. I don't believe that I, I certainly don't set out to be. Uh, but I do look at things from a from a Christian point of view. I do believe that I, I, um, I take a genuine attempt to look at history from the point of view uh, of a of a non biased observer. Uh, and the purpose of this video is to try and give a non-biased perspective about particular events that have occurred. Alrighty, let's get into it. Okay, so the Germanic tribes in... There's also a large misconception, I think, as well. And, and some of the, the written sources have some genuine uh, deficiencies in that Bede, for example perceives the existing Britons and Saxons to be population of England at the time to be non-Christian, which actually wasn't the case. In, there were pagans absolutely in, in Britain at the time, but that said, uh, there were also many Christians. The Christian church was very well established in parts of England. The reason that had occurred is because Christianity was the state religion of Rome, and therefore, all Roman citizens were really, in a, in a Roman way, encouraged to be Christian. The Christian church at the time was very, very different to the Christian church of today. Uh, in, in some ways, and I, I say this as a Christian, I think it's incredibly disappointing, the fundamentalist views and the kind of black and white views that um, polarise the Christian church in so many ways of um, today. Alrighty, let's, uh, let's, let's start to look at this. What I really want to do is look at, um, in this video, I really want to have a look at um, essentially what happened around the conversion period and also I want to have a look at, uh, I guess, the motivations for the conversion. Um, this is really important and I really want to have a look at it. Alrighty, so Lastly, before we get into the video, I really want to say that having never travelled to Scandinavia, uh, my pronunciation of, of many of these words is going to be just way off and in fact probably possibly laughable to a few people. I do sincerely apologise. Um, I, I, I just, I'm naive around some of the pronunciations and I, as I say, I apologise for that. Alrighty, let's go. Okay, um, the first real attempt to start the process of Christianization was from a, a Christian monk, I guess you'll call it that. Um, and his name was Wilbrod in around the year 710. He was from Frisia uh, and he went to Schleswig. I, I do apologize, I'm very sorry. Um, and again in 714, but he had no real success. 
that's, that's really all we know about that period. Um, it's, it's, it's quite possible that uh, this particular monk went in with the intention of trying to convert a bit more forcibly or a bit more enthusiastically than what actually occurred and it's also quite possible that the pagans that he encountered for the purposes of this video I want to use the word pagan and heathen relatively speaking interchangeably I do acknowledge there's many differences between these two religions that said um, I'm no expert about the differences between pagans and heathens and I think I want to keep this video at a level where we can kind of um, all understand it. I'm really simply looking at dates and historical facts more so than the intricacies of some of these religious points. Alrighty, so the, the next real attempt uh, at the conversions in this particular area of course came from Charlemagne. This, I think, is probably one of the blackest moments in Christianity, uh, certainly that I'm aware of, um, at, at this time period anyway. And what happened was, in October 782, Charlemagne essentially put an ultimatum to a large population uh, of, of Saxons, and there would have been some other tribes around that area at that time. For the sake of history, um, they're referred to purely as Saxons. Four and a half thousand were massacred uh, at a place called Verdun. Um, this is a, a moment in history which I, I think is utterly reprehensible. Um, and I, I, I think it shows the naivety at the time, but the brutality at the time. Um, ethnic cleansing was, was not unheard of, um, the Romans did it all the time, so it's, it's simply the way things were done. That said, when we look at it through modern morals and ethics, the next real attempt was made in about the year 822. Archbishop Reims got a papal mandate to convert the north, as it was referred to at the time, and he was actually invited by the Danish King Harold. In this time there was a uh, another Christian monk called Anugar and he lived around about the year 801 to 865 and he seems to have had a very successful uh, and very long life in the northern areas um, and he in, in around Scandinavia uh, he established a church which survived and he had a Christian community which again survived uh, and they seemed to live quite peacefully amongst the pagans and heathens. So I guess what I'll do is I'll include at this time that the Christian church was, was quite happy to incorporate different belief systems uh, into and different religious symbols and symbolisms uh, into the religious practice to try and bring people together. I, I, and I think we'll get into this a little bit more later on. And this was definitely not conversion by the sword at all. Charlemagne tried that and it failed miserably. Um, in fact, a lot of people argue that the Massacre of Verdun was a big instigator for what happened with the, the the Viking raids. We're going to talk about the Viking raids and the reasons for them in another video. That said, um, I, I, I think there's some credibility there. Uh, Enigar also travelled into Sweden uh, at the invitation of the Swedish king Bjorn uh, to a place called um, Burka. It's, it's also quite possible that uh, Christianity was starting to grow in popularity uh, uh, throughout Scandinavia with traders and marketeers as well as uh, slaves uh, who would have brought Christianity um, to, to Scandinavia. Uh, and, I, and I don't see any reason why any of that is um, incomprehensible or, or unlikely. We know that um, Christianity was really actually starting to thrive throughout um, Scandinavia at this time. And King Gorm the Old of 
Denmark actually became quite famous for persecuting the Christians until he married his wife Threa. I believe that's how you pronounce her name. I, I apologise if that's incorrect. And at that point, he then began to tolerate the Christians far more and in fact um, seemed to get along with them quite well. King Harold Bluetooth in 958 uh, at least converted the majority of Denmark to Christianity uh, enthusiastically and that's carved into the Jellingstone. At this point, uh, the Christian church established three large bishoprics uh, in Scandinavia. Now we have to understand as well, I think, that modern Scandinavia is a bit different to uh, the Scandinavia of this period. Borders have changed significantly uh, and, and uh, towns and cities have, have changed and moved it around a little bit. These bishoprics were Arras, Riob, and Shrewsbury. Uh, again, I'm very sorry about my pronunciations. Across the sea, another significant conversion to Christianity also occurred. Now, we've all heard of the, the Great Heathen Army, um, and when that attacked uh, what is today England, uh, uh, many, but definitely not all, of those Scandinavian raiders or Vikings would have been um, pagans or heathens. However, um, there was a significant number of uh, Saxons and various other peoples who joined in that army. This definitely was not exclusively a, a Scandinavian army. Now, we, we also know that uh, King Guthrum d was defeated by Alfred the Great at Eddington in the year 878. Following a, a, a significant battle with the Saxons, the, the Viking army, and they were being defeated. They decided to return to their camp to try and form a defensive position. And they were pursued uh, aggressively by the Saxons. Guthrum, as I understand it, uh, had his camp in an elevated position on a hill. And the Saxons laid uh, siege to this hill and, the, and Guthrum was unable to get food or water to his people. And so after two weeks they surrendered. Uh, perfectly reasonable. <laughs> They would have been going insane. All right. Um, what followed was the Treaty of Wedmore, where Guthrum and at least 30 of his leading men, various Jarls and so on, were all converted to Christianity. Now, in those days, generally speaking, if the king or the lord or the, uh, the leader converted to a particular religion, it was, was pretty much given that that was a, uh, a leadership initiative and that other people should follow. So there would have been a, a very significant conversion to Christianity uh, by the Vikings uh, in, in England at this time. And we also know that the French king, Charles the Simple, converted Rollo and quite a number of his men to Christianity uh, when they took uh, hold of Normandy. And the Normans, as we know, once they started to assimilate into the French population, or, or what is today the French population, and they uh, began to take in French customs through marriage and through to their children and so on, then essentially they became very passionate Christians and they, uh, in, in fact, they really championed the cause of Christianity. So let's look at some of the motivations here for the wider conversion to Christianity from the, the pagan point of view. Now, while we're talking about England, we, we need to mention Sven Falkbeard. He had a, a, a large, uh, I guess, confliction with the Christianity, wanted to go back to the pagan ways and so on. His son, Canute, who became Canute the Great, um, also uh, had, a, had a very strong conflict with Christians at some points. However, he also um, enthusiastically embraced Christianity. Uh, and you can see, even during the, um, the Dane law, that many priests in Yorkshire, what is today Yorkshire and so on, um, had, had good relationships and good positive relationships with their uh, the Viking overlords. And whilst Canute was uh, essentially a pagan, but he still had a, a very positive and very long relationship with the Christians. I think you could say the Christianization enabled 
Canute's vision of a North Sea Empire. Canute's empire stretched not only through the vast majority of what is today England, because we have fluctuations, if you like, of the Welsh borders and the Scottish borders and so on, but, but that aside, you had essentially England, you had numerous islands around England, you had um, significant parts of what is today Scandinavia. Uh, in Norway, Hakon the Good, a king, had a very positive relationship with Christians. So I want to have a look at some of the, um, the, uh, the motivations, I guess, around the conversion to Christianity. Definitely wasn't uh, a conversion by the sword. This was not a forced conversion, uh, and this was not um, a conversion where huge amounts of pressure were applied. We, we can see very clearly that when that was attempted by um, Charlemagne, it failed miserably, and in fact it not only bit you know, Charlemagne on the rear end, it, um, it, it would have caused huge amounts of pain for the French because uh, I, I think, you know, that instigated a great deal of the um, conflict and rivalry between the, uh, the Scandinavians and the French. Rightio, so if it wasn't by the sword, then let's take a look at what it would have been. As I said, um, I believe that slaves would have had something to do with it. I also think that marketeers and traders would have also had a lot to do with it. The, the Scandinavians at this time were definitely not exclusively Vikings. And that means that they were not just about raiding and pirating and pillaging and destroying Christian sort of institutions. Um, the Scandinavians were probably as, as far more so about trading and crafting and building and exploring and innovating than they were about anything else. Um, so I, I, I think that has a lot to do with it. The Scandinavians had raided into areas, especially when you think about places like England or France or um, you know other areas, a lot of them decided that they could overwinter there or they could stay longer, which would enable them to set up, I suppose, bases for future raids and that kind of thing. When they were doing that, there was a mix with the local population and inevitably many of these Scandinavian men, because they were primarily men, uh, would have started to intermarry with the local population and I think that would have brought Christianity into their camps. One of Christianity's big appealing factors to Scandinavians and other pagans and heathens was that uh, it offered heaven for everyone. So Valhalla was strictly speaking um, for so-called Viking warriors who died in battle. And therefore, uh, if you didn't die in battle, you may not get in. And for many, many, many Scandinavian women, therefore, uh, they didn't necessarily see themselves as going into an afterlife. So, there is this, um, along comes Christianity and says, well, hang on, we offer an afterlife for everyone, providing you do, you know, good things and, and live a life of um, ethics and morals. <clears throat> and I think that would have had a massive, massive appeal to Scandinavian and pagan and heathen women. Uh, and I think that would have had a lot to do with the conversion too. However, another massive factor which is often overlooked is that uh, one of the popes, I can't remember which one, said that um, no Christian is to trade with a pagan or a heathen. From an economic sense, there would have been uh, a great deal of frustration, I think, amongst the, the heathens and the, the pagans. And I think this would have brought out, um, at, at least initially, um, many of these uh, men, as I say primarily men, would have, um, you know, bring out their crosses, so to speak, and then when they were back on their ships, take out their Thor's hammers. And that's perfectly okay and understandable and perfectly reasonable. These, these kind of factors all played a part of this conversion. So I think, um, to summarise here, we, we actually have, the, the evidence is incredibly strong that this conversion to Christianity was quite um, enduring, it was, relatively speaking, peaceful. 
There was a, a significant outbreak of violence by Olav Haraldsson and Olav Thurgelsson. This lasted for some years in, uh, I believe it was Norway. Olav Haraldsson was later sainted uh, throughout this period. It's important to understand, however, that um, historians have looked at these events and said that religious circumstances were only partially to blame. So there would have been a lot of personal rivalries, a lot of um, competing interests from different tribes and different clans and different clusters, uh, and which all would have contributed to, to the conflict that ensued. However, that was basically the end of the, the conflict as far as the, the, the conversion to Christianity went for this particular period of time. Now, there was some other conflict that occurred later on, um, but that was much later. But if we, well, I'm really looking at kind of like pre 11th century here, so that whole period really between the sort of 5th century, end of Rome, through to uh, you know, 10th century, 11th century. Righto guys, I hope you found today's uh, video interesting. Um, please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.